Well, here we are again, folks. Hey, Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. We've been uh, this day in the book of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, we've covered three verses. And we did a little 29-minute uh, and some seconds or 30-minute uh, excerpt on the first three verses, which was fun. When I love it. I love it, I love it, and I love it. When uh, I've read and read it and read it, I got it mar so marked up, I can't <laughs> hardly tell what it says in uh, this particular Bible. And uh, I use, like I say, many different Bibles, all the King James Version. And I do look at the perversions uh, sometimes, too, and see where they have changed a word of two. And by changing the word, they've changed the meaning. And so, therefore, you have to be careful uh, in, in Hebrews here. Christ was made better than the angels. And there was a reason for that. In Hebrews uh, uh, 1 and 4, we're going to read this here. And look at it. Uh, we're going to look in, in between uh, 1 and verse 4. We're going to read it. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now the angels have a name as a group of beings and they're called angels. We're called people. And so people have a, an existence on this earth. Angels have an existence in the presence of God. And Jesus was in the presence of God. But he came to the earth and did something the angels were not allowed to do. He came and walked on this earth as a man. Now, the angels, the falling angels, somebody's going to say, well, Peter, I read back in the Old Testament where the angels came down on the earth and uh, made babies with the uh, women, and there were giants on the earth. Yes, there were. They were also cursed. They were also cursed for their falling from their original state where they were supposed to be, and falling from their original duties, which they had. What is the duty of an angel? We have angels that are appointed to watch over us. Each man on this earth, man, woman, boy, or girl, has a guardian angel put in charge of him. And your guardian angel fights for you, and fends for you. And my goodness, my angel <laughs> throughout my lifetime has been the busiest angel that ever lived. Keeping me alive when I was back a drunk and uh, tempted God to kill me every day that I was alive or to kill myself by foolishness and many other things. So, uh, he was pointed a little better than the angels. Let's take a look at something right there. Uh, in uh, uh, verse 4, in verse 4, and uh, chapter 1, let me see what I want to look at right here, right quick. I, I do a study. Reading the Bible, if you read the Bible without studying it, you miss a lot. So, one day you need to read the Bible through. Just read it through. Kind of nonsensical or or don't study it, but read it through. Just read it through, which I've done. And then come back and read it through uh, again with, with a little bit of study. And then come back and, and read it through and find out what it really says and study it. Being made a little uh, much better than the angels. Let's see our references that we were looking at here this morning. And why and what it says about him being made a little better than the angels. And uh, we're in chapter 1 and verse 4. And I got to find out where I was. And see, I have a little study thing here in front of me that says this is where you are. The benefits, the benefits that, w that come through the Father the benefits that come through Christ for you and I uh, are not the same benefits like come through an angel. 
These are the benefits to come, go to the Father through the Son. You can't go to the Father, God, through an angel. There are people out here today who worship angels. They follow angels. They have collections all around them of angels. They speak of the angel. My boy, angel watching over me. This angel, that angel. No, God the Son is watching over you. Do not give reverence to an angel when you need to be given reverence to the Son of God. Be very careful who you give reverence to. And by the inheritance uh, of what God gave him, the inheritance, he obtained a more excellent name than they. What inheritance? The inheritance of this world. He inherited this world from the Father. How did he inherit it? Well, Matthew one twenty one says he was born on this earth. And if you got a Bible uh, near, right handy, uh, just pop her back there. Uh, gra grab your Bible and go back to Matthew and, and see where it's talking about that. In uh, Matthew 1, 21. This is how you study your Bible. If, if you learn how to turn the pages, turn the pages. You say, well, I, I got a telephone right here. Brother Peter, I can do that. Well, if you can pop it back to Matthew 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And was David the son of Abraham? Huh. His daddy's name wasn't Abraham, but he was the son of Abraham because Abraham was the first Jewish person, and therefore David was the Jewish person chose to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to give us 14 uh, uh, things about Jesus. And so, well, let's read them right quick like. It said, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas, and Judas begat his brethren. And, and Judas begat uh, Perez, and Perez Zerah, and Tamar, and Perez begat Esam, and Esam begat Aram, and Aram begat Amanda did, and Amanda did, did uh, begat Nason, Nason begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz, and uh, Rahab, and uh, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Let's start right there, verse 5 for a second. Uh, in this lineage right here, we read uh, some stories. If you'll go back and take a, a book, I got one right back here that says, Who's Who in the Bible? Every single one of these people, every one of these people are uh, listed in that Who's Who book. Have you got a who's who's book of your generation? No. And nobody else has either. Oh, they think they can go back, but they miss people and they miss stuff. There's no missing in this. This is all fact. You can go back and check every one of them out. You, you won't miss these. There's no mistake in the 47 generations or 45 here uh, generations if you go all the way back. But what's listed here are the generations they want us to see right here. And Jesse begat David, the king. And David, the king, begat Solomon and of, of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Wow. Man. <laughs> if you could read these stories, if you could see what Brother Peter can see, because I've studied these people. I studied him and the wife of Uriah. And, and you say, my goodness, how did that happen? Well, God had a way of it happening. He, he brought down through Rahab. Rahab had the name of Ahala. And, and I, I, love to, I love to stand up and justify her. I love to say this. And how much fact is in it, Brother Peter? I don't know, but I do know this. I know that one day, all those children that were in that city were stole away from the Jews by the Babylonians and by other people. And I believe this little girl, Rahab, she was stole away over there, put in the palace of the king, put in the house up there of a king, and used by the king. The king had her had a handmaid over there with her, and she was the king's handmaid too. And, and the king came to her when he wanted to and used her. She had the name of Rahab the Hollet, in, uh, according to the people. According to the people. And so therefore, uh, God delivered her. And she's in the lineage of Jesus. David, he's in the lineage of Jesus. And by the way, 
When God looks at a man, he looks at his heart. When God looked at David's heart, David's heart was as pure as gold. David's heart was transparent. Did David do many things in the flesh that seemed like they were not proper? Yes, he did. And in the flesh, in the flesh, man cannot please God. Anything David did in the flesh that was against God, it can't please God in the flesh. Neither can you and I. If we're trying to live in the flesh <coughs> to inherit the kingdom of heaven, we're going to miss it. So here, here we have uh, Solomon, uh, Rehoboam. Rehoboam begat Aba, Aba begat Asa, Asa begat uh, Josephat, Josephat begat Jerome, and Jerome begat Ozis, Ozis begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Ahaz, Ahaz begat Ezekiah and uh, Ezekiah gate begat uh, Manasseh and Manasseh begat Ammon and Ammon begat Joseph and Joseph begat uh, Jehoiakim and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Did you hear that? Verse 11 about the time they were carried away to Babylon. When they got carried away they didn't have a choice. They did not have a choice. You remember Nehemiah? Nehemiah was a servant to the king. He became the cupbearer. He was stole away from and by Babylon and the Babylonians, and they stole him away when he was a young man. And now he's thirty-three years old, thirty or thirty-three years old, and and he comes before the king and asks the king, "Can he go back and build the walls of Jerusalem?" This this was a. a, a like a convict, he was a, he was a uh, a servant. Uh, but you know what? You look at this. Look, think about it. Nehemiah is living in the king's palace. He has to taste everything the king eats before the king eats it. Make sure it's not poison or whatever. Who do you think gets the best of the food? <laughs> Why? Because Nehemiah does. He's second to the king when it comes to the eating. And, and he gets the best of the food. He's in a good place. Uh, he's not in the kitchen cooking. The cook makes it and brings it to him and says, okay it. And he eats some of it and okays it. He can eat as much as he wants and okay it. And uh, he could drink a little sip of the king's wine, the best wine. He, he had everything. Uh, God gave him everything and he was a servant. Did he need money? Of course he didn't need money. He had the best clothes. He had royal clothes. He could not go before the king and, and not be in royal clothes. So he went, here he is. He's, he's been stole away, but he's in royal clothes. He's under the royalty of the king of Babylon. And he even has such a rapport with the king, the king re, uh, grants his request. Wow. You say, Brother Peter, you're in the New Testament over here reading genealogy and you're talking about Nehemiah. Listen, God had a plan. And he brought that plan through from the Old Testament. Now, I re I'm telling you, when you're reading the New Testament, you go back, look at these people. I just read uh, 14, 28 generations, if I'm not mistaken right here. I just read, and these 20 generations are uh, f from the beginning and the people coming through up to Christ. And many of them were slaves. They were slaves of the who they were, were under. Like I told you a little while ago about Rahab there. She was a slave. She was a servant. And, and after they were brought uh, to Babylon, it says here, Jehoiakim begat uh, uh, Southel, and Southel begat Zerubbabel. And you think if I'm murdering these names, you ought to see me... 35, 40 years ago, when I couldn't read it all. When I got saved at the age of 30, I couldn't read one word in this book. Not even the first one. And I've had to learn how to read this book since I was 30 years old. I'm 73 now, and I, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> you try it. <laughs> and Joseph begat Jehoiakim and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now, after this was brought to the Babylon to to Babylon 
Jehoiakim begat Solomon. Now, now listen to this. Fourteen more generations. Where do they come from? They come out of the country of Babylon. They come from the people out of Babylon, but they're, Jesus, they're God's people. But remember now, they're captives of Babylon. They're not Babylonians. They're Jewish people taken to Babylon, and they're having children still, and the lineage is going on. God has prepared the lineage of Jesus Christ perfect. Perfect. Even back then, hey, let me, let me show you one. Go back to the children of Israel in your mind, if you understand the Bible at all, and, and go back when they were being, they came from Egypt. Just before they came from Egypt, one of the last plagues was a death angel was coming. Now the death angel was going to get the firstborn, that's the oldest person, the firstborn, that was the oldest person uh, in the family of every Egyptian. And that was the firstborn of every family of the Jewish people, the Israelite, if he didn't put the blood on his doorpost, on the lintel at the top and on the sides of the doorpost and on the threshold. Say so he had to sprinkle that blood, or put a dab of that blood from that uh, escape goat, a sheep, or whatever it was that he used that night to kill. And he was not to kill more than could be eaten in that house. Because the next day, they were fixing to head out for a long trek. They're fixing to head down to the Red Sea. <laughs> so, uh, but here they are. Now, I want to show you this. We're talking about the lineage over here in Matthew chapter 1. Now, when they headed out for the Red Sea, uh, when the death angel came, excuse me, when the death angel came, he, the death angel knew the firstborn of every man, woman, in every house. The first, well, that was the oldest one. Not only that, listen to this, the firstborn of every animal. You say, are you serious, Brother Peter? I'm as serious as a heart attack. That's what it says. Read it. The firstborn of every animal, too. How did God know the firstborn of every animal? God knows everything. My friend, get in your brain and in your heart and in your life and in your head that God is almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-being, everywhere, at all, omniscient. He is omni he's omnipresent. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all at one time. He's omniscient. He knows everything all at one time. He knows every thought in your brain. He knows you from the hey. He knows you from the end to the beginning. He really knows what the end of your life is going to be. Uh, you might think this is funny for me to say, but he knew I was going to be sitting here in front of this computer, uh, a a a a. Uh, 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 I don't know what to call myself other than unlearned. I'm an unlearned person. I've had to learn the Bible. But the only thing I really know is the Bible. Good. I am a paint contractor by trade. And I'm a good one. I'm one of the best of the best in paint contracting. You say, you're bragging a little bit. Well, I may be. But God gave me a way to learn how to paint. After I got saved in 1972, an alcoholic, I was a painter. And probably not a very good one. I went to work for myself, and I spent my days praying while I was working. I talked to the Lord, and I prayed. I said, Lord, give me the ability to strike a line like no other person has ever struck a line. Give me the ability to paint windows. I painted windows throughout my life for 30 or 40 years. I painted windows, and I can paint a window without getting a speck of paint on the glass and paint a window in, in between 7 and 12 minutes, the average 6 over 6 light window, and can still do it. And it still is my prayer time. <laughs> I ain't changed a bit. I pray about it. When I'm cutting a window out, I'm praying. Lord, give me this window. First thing you have to do in old windows, you have to scrape around the wood a little bit. And then you have to dust it with a duster. And then you... I uh, had to get your primer on it, and then you get your paint on it, and you leave your glass clean, and you do it uh, uh, correctly. And I've taught my boys. I had six children, all of them, are painters of some type. 
and uh, uh, self-employed. By the way, I, I taught my children to be self-employed. Hey, if you want to follow something, follow through with it, follow it all the way, do the best you can, do what's proper, and you'll come out in the good part in the end. That's all I can tell you. Just follow through. Do everything you do as unto the Lord. I painted as unto the Lord. I didn't paint for that person. Yes, I was going to get a payday from that person. I wasn't painting for that person. I was painting for the Lord. For the glory of God, I'm doing the best I can do. And when I walk away from there, they say, that man there is a painter. That man there, he knows what he's doing. He's a painter. And I love to say, see people say, he's a Christian. <laughs> Anybody say, uh, anywhere within 40 miles in any direction from this house, if my name's mentioned, they say, oh, you mean that nut that goes around talking about Jesus all the time. All the time. Passing out tracks all the time. All the time. Taking stuff out of his pocket. And, and, and this thing or that thing, he's a surprise to you. You never know what he's going to pull out. I pull these things out here. These are invitations to a thing we do call judgment journey at our church. A, a thing, if you're within a uh, thousand miles of LaGrange, Georgia, it would be worth getting a busload of people out and come down and come through Judgment Journey and buy your tickets online, JJ, Judgment Journey, LaGrangeGeorgia.com, and you can buy your tickets out of FaithLaGrange.com and come to Judgment Journey. It's a little 14 acre piece of land. Uh, that we have some 400 people down there as actors and we have a trail down there and we do a portrayal of the Bible of the end time of Revelation and it's horrendously effective. Uh, last year we put some 22,000 people through, had some 7,000 convert. This year we plan on trying to put 30,000 through and have 10,000 converts. And uh, it starts in October and like I say, if you'll go to LaGrange.com, Faith LaGrange, uh, uh, you will find the information on that. Well, we went through down to 16, Jacob and Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, we went through his lineage and came to him. And in his lineage were the people of the Old Testament. And by the way, the key to this New Testament, my friend, remember, is the Old Testament. Get you a good study Bible. Get you a good study Bible. A King James Version study Bible with a lot of references in it. That you can go back every time you read a verse over on the side. It gives you the Old Testament scripture that it came from. All scripture came from the past. Came from the past. And uh, uh, all of it, you can go back and, it, and find the anointing of that scripture in the New Testament. You say, Brother Peter, you mean that I can go back 2,000 years in the Old Testament and find Christ? Yes, you can. You can go back to the uh, Genesis 3 and 15, the 15th verse of the book of Genesis and find Jesus. <laughs> and then you can come all the way where you say, Peter, the flood took place and only eight souls were saved. Did Jesus come through there? He sure did. He came through that line, right up through that line. God made provision for him to come. And those eight souls, Jesus was in the loins of one of those eight souls that came through uh, the, the flood. Now, let's look. We hadn't even got, we were in verse 4. <laughs> we're in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 1, and we have spent 24 minutes, and we hadn't even got going yet. It said, being made so much better than the angels. And we looked in our sideline, and we found out the Jews had the highest opinion uh, of the angels and even associated with God, men with God. And the angels were, but the Jewish people were associated with God through the Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, Paul proves that Jesus is God to be worshipped 
by the angels see Christ better than angels and we, we see that and let me look at a place where it says Christ was better than the angels and he was he was better than the angels he was made a little lower but he was the spokesman of God and none of the angels were spokesmen for God in the sense that Jesus was there was an angel that came down and spoke uh, God I have had him speak to people and to do things uh, look right here it said he was stronger than the angels he was mightier than the angels he was more excellent than the angels uh, he, it's said in the book of Hebrews 13 times that he was, there was, he was the better thing. He was the better thing, better than the angels. And uh, look at this. In, in 1, 1 through 3, we read uh, that he was better than the prophets. Let's see, 1 through 3, he was better than the prophets. God, who at sundry times and divers man has spake unto us in the past by the prophets, hath in these days spoken to us by his Son. So he proceeded, uh, the, uh, and well, he did proceed, but he succeeded the priest in the fact that he was the high priest, the priest that spokesman for God. He better than the angels was in verse 4. We just read that. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 18. Let's take a quick look. You say, Brother Peter, how are you getting those those things? I have some directions here in the Bible to go and find out these things. You need to get a Bible that you can trace, go forward and go backwards and find things that you need to. You're studying, this is a study book. This Bible is a study book. It's a book to live by, but any book to live by, you have to know it. I don't care who you are, what kind of job you had. You have to learn it. You have guidelines for that job. And you have, if you're an office man, you're sitting at a desk, and you have a boss or a supervisor, and he comes by and you're doodling on a piece of paper and not in the context that you're supposed to be in for the day that he's paying you to do, he might get on you. He's got a manual too, and this manual says if you hire on to this office, you will, if you're on the telephone doing telephone call, you will do those. You will stick to the program. You will stick to the plan. You will use these words that we give you. And that's the Bible. We're using the words of the Bible. Verse 18 of chapter 2. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Wow. That is a scripture I need every single day. The word suckered. You get your little bottle. You find your little deer somewhere. Got separated from his mama. And you get your little titty bottle, little milk bottle. And you stuff it on that, ba that little deer. And he stays alive. Because you're suckering him through his time of trouble. And that's us. You and I are going to be tempted every day from the day we get saved until the day we die. But Jesus has got this titty bottle, the Word, right here in front of me. This Word is the titty bottle that we're to drink from. This is the one we're to sucker on. We are to catch on to it, latch on to it, use it on a daily basis, and get in it, and find out what it says, and where to do that. Ah, uh, Chapter 3 and verse 18. Let's look at that. Chapter 3 and verse 18. And uh, we're going on. And we're, we're doing a little study right in front of you. I'm doing what I do by myself all the time. It said, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. They do not believe. Before I was a believer in Jesus Christ, I couldn't enter into his rest. The only way you get in his rest is by believing in him, and then you get the free rest of Jesus Christ. There is no rest in this world. This world will not give you rest. 
you cannot find rest, you cannot find peace, you can drink all the beer you want, and you're going to get like I did when I was 30 years old, sitting on Suicide Hill. Hey, do you know that the movie stars of this day who have millions, here's this guy going to get married in the next week, and he's going to spend $13 million, they said, on his wedding. Do you know that $13 million will not bring him happiness? As a matter of fact, after the wedding's done, he's probably going to have some a few million dollars of regret. And, and down the line, he may be one that ends up committing suicide if he stays with that pattern and follows that pattern of trying to please self. You cannot please yourself. You can, the only way you can please yourself is through God, through Jesus Christ. And that's the only way you can do it. And my time has come and gone. I've ran over here. And I'm going to quit now. And I'm going to get back in Hebrews again on the next excerpt. Remember, this day is the 27th day of the ninth month. And I'm going to get back in Hebrews on this day of the month again. We'll see you next time. Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. Bye-bye.